I was, 200 feet under the sea, on the hunt for the great white stingray, which had already stung 10 swimmers. People were afraid to step into the water, and panic had spread all up and down the coast. That's why they sent for me, William Deep Jr. of Baltimore, Maryland, the world-famous undersea explorer, thank you very much. I captured the great white shark that had terrorized Myrtle Beach. He wasn't so great. I fought the giant octopus that ate the entire California championship surfing team. I unplugged the electric eel that sent shockwaves all over Miami. But now, I face the fight of my life, the great white stingray. I had everything I needed. Scuba suit, flippers, mask, oxygen tank, and a poison dart gun. Wait, did something move? Just behind the giant clam? I raised my dart gun and waited for an attack. Then, suddenly, I couldn't breathe. My oxygen tank. Someone must have tampered with it. I desperately tried to kick to the surface, but I was losing strength. I searched through the fog mask for my diving partner. She was swimming up at the surface near the boat. I waved my arms like a maniac. Finally, she swam toward me and dragged my dazed and limp body to the surface. What's your problem, Aquaman? No air! Someone cut off tank! Oh, get real, Billy. Can't you snorkel without acting like a total jerk? My diving partner was really my bratty sister, Sheena. And I was only pretending to be an undersea explorer. But would it kill Sheena to go along with it? My name is actually William Deep Jr., but everybody calls me Billy. I'm 12 and Sheena is 10. We both have straight black hair, but mine is short and hers goes down to her shoulders. We're both skinny with knobby knees and elbows, and long, narrow feet. We both have dark blue eyes and thick, dark eyebrows. Other than that, we're not alike at all. Sheena has no imagination. She was never afraid of monsters in her closet when she was little, and she didn't even believe in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. She loves to say, there's no such thing. I dove underwater and pinched Sheena's leg. Stop it! Hey, you two, be careful down there. My uncle stood on the deck of his sea lab boat, the Cassandra. He peered down at Sheena and me snorkeling nearby. My uncle's name is George Deep, but everybody calls him Dr. D. Even my dad, who is his brother, of course. Dr. D is short, thin, wears glasses, and a very serious, thoughtful expression. He's a marine biologist who studies tropical fish and ocean plants. Sheena and I were visiting him on the Cassandra. Dr. D is a marine biologist. He studies the habits of tropical fish and looks for new kinds of ocean plants and fish that haven't been discovered yet. Sheena and I were visiting him on the Cassandra, a big, sturdy boat about 50 feet long. Dr. D uses most of the space for labs and research rooms. On deck is a cockpit where he steers the boat. He keeps a dinghy tied to the starboard, or uh, what they call the right side of the deck, and a huge glass tank on the port. They call that the left side. Sometimes Dr. D catches very big fish and keeps them temporarily in the glass tank. Usually just long enough to tag the fish for, like, research or some sort of study. Or care for them if they are, like, sick or injured. Stick close together, kids, and don't swim off too far. Especially you, Billy. There have been reports of some shark sightings in the area. Sharks? Wow! Now, Billy, this is serious. Don't leave the boat and don't go near the reef. Don't worry about me, Dr. D. I won't get into trouble. Good. Now, don't forget, if you see a shark fin, try not to splash around a lot. Movement will attract it. Just slowly, steadily return to the boat. We won't forget. I couldn't help feeling just a little bit excited. I'd always wanted to spot a shark's fin on the horizon, heading right for us. I wanted adventure. The Cassandra was anchored in the Caribbean Sea, off a tiny island called Alandra, a long red coral reef. A clamshell reef surrounded the island. Between the reef and the island stretched a beautiful lagoon. I mean, nothing was going to stop me from exploring that lagoon, no matter what Dr. D said. Soon, Sheena and I were surrounded by hundreds of tiny neon blue fish. They began to swim away, and I swam with them. They were so great looking. I didn't want them to leave me behind. Suddenly, the fish all darted from view. Had something scared them away? I glanced around and saw a flash of red. I floated closer, peering through the mask. A few yards ahead, I saw the bumpy red formations of Clamshell Reef. 
I was tempted to explore a little. So the reef looked like a red sand castle filled with underwater caves and tunnels. Bright blue and yellow fish darted in and out of them. It was great. Suddenly, I felt something brush against my leg. A fish? I didn't see anything. Then I felt a tingling against my leg. And again, I turned to see what it was, but nothing was there. My heart began to race really fast. I turned and started back for the boat, kicking hard. But something grabbed my right leg and held on. I froze in fear. Help! Sheena! Dr. D! I was dragged below the surface, and I felt the slimy tentacle tighten around my ankle. Through the churning waters, I saw a sea monster with one giant brown eye. Its mouth opened in a silent cry, revealing two rows of huge, jagged, sharp teeth. An enormous octopus with twelve long, slimy tentacles. One was wrapped around my ankle. I, I mean, another one slid toward me. I struggled to the surface, but the huge creature dragged me down and down again. As I sank, scenes from my life actually flashed before my eyes. I saw my parents waving to me as I boarded the yellow school bus for my first day of school. Mom and Dad, I mean, I thought I'd never see them again. What a way to go, killed by a sea monster. I mean, no one would even ever believe it. Everything started to turn red. I felt dizzy, weak, but something was pulling me, pulling me to the surface. I opened my eyes and I stared up at Dr. D. Billy, are you all right? I heard you screaming and I saw you thrashing about. I, I swam over from the boat as fast as I could. What happened? I kicked my right leg. The slimy tentacle was gone. The dark creature had vanished. Dr. D slipped a rubber lifesaver ring over my head and I floated easily now. I had lost my flippers in the struggle. My mask and snorkel dangled around my neck. Sheena swam over and floated beside me, treading water. It, it was a sea monster! A, a huge one! I felt its slimy tentacle grabbing my leg and, and, well, it was so big I didn't... Billy, Billy, you and your wild imagination. You nearly scared me to death. Please, don't ever do that again. Your leg probably got all tangled in a piece of seaweed, that's all. But, but... There's seaweed everywhere. But I saw it! I saw its tentacles! And its big, pointy, sharp-looking teeth! Well, let's discuss it on the boat. Come on, swim back with me. And stay away from the reef. Swim around it. He turned around and started swimming toward the Cassandra. Why didn't they believe me? I had seen the creature grab my leg. It wasn't a stupid clump of seaweed. It wasn't my imagination. I'd find that creature and show it to them myself, but not today. Now I was ready to get back to the safety of the boat. I swam up to Sheena. Hey, Sheena, race you to the boat. Last one there is a chocolate-colored jellyfish. Wait, that's no fair. You're wearing flippers. Take those off. Too bad. See you at the boat. I watched her splash away, building a good lead. She's not going to win. It would be faster just to swim over the reef and take a shortcut. But I started to swim straight toward the red coral. Billy, get back here. I pretended I didn't hear him. The reef loomed ahead. I was almost there. I saw Sheena splashing ahead of me. I kicked extra hard. I knew she'd never have the guts to swim over the reef. She'd swim around the end of it. So I would cut through and beat her. But my arm suddenly began to ache. I don't think I was used to swimming so far. I reached the reef. And I turned around. Sheena was swimming around the reef, so I figured I'd had a few seconds to rest. I stepped onto the coral reef. Suddenly, my foot started to burn as if it was on fire. The throbbing pain shot up my leg. I dove into the water. When I surfaced, Sheena was yelling. Dr. D, come quick! Billy, what's the problem now? I saw him do something really stupid. My foot. I stepped on the reef and, and, well... Oh, that's painful, but you'll be all right. The burning will stop in a little while. All that bright red coral is fire coral. It's covered with a mild poison. When it touches your skin, it burns like fire. Don't you know anything? Listen, you're lucky you only burned your foot. Coral can be very sharp. You could have cut your foot and gotten poison into your bloodstream. Then you'd really be in trouble. Wow, what kind of trouble? Well, that kind of poison could paralyze you. Oh, that's great. So just keep away from the red coral from now on, and stay away from the lagoon, too. 
But that's where the sea monster lives. We have to go back there. I have to show it to you, Dr. D. No such thing. Right, Dr. D? Well, you never know. We don't know all of the creatures that live in the ocean, Sheena. It's better to say that scientists have never seen one. So there, She-Ra. Listen, kids, I'm serious about staying away from this area. There may not be a sea monster in that lagoon, but there could be sharks, poisonous fish, electric eels, any number of dangerous creatures. Now, don't swim over there. How's your foot feeling, Billy? It's a little better now. Good. Enough adventure for one morning. Let's go back to the boat. It's almost lunchtime. We all started swimming back to the Cassandra. As I kicked, I felt something tickle my leg again. Seaweed? No. It brushed against my thigh like fingers. I spun around to splash water in Sheena's face, but she was up ahead swimming beside Dr. D. I stared down at the water, suddenly gripped with terror. What was down there? Was it gonna grab me again and pull me down forever? Alexander Dubrow, Dr. D's assistant, helped us aboard the boat. As I climbed up the ladder, he grabbed my hands and pulled me aboard. Hey, I heard shouting. Is everything okay? Everything is fine, Alexander. Billy stepped on some fire coral, but he's all right. Wow, Billy, fire coral. I accidentally bumped into the fire coral my first day here. I saw stars. I really did, man. You sure you're okay? It feels better now. But that wasn't the worst thing that happened. I was almost eaten by a huge sea monster. No such thing. No such thing. I really saw it. They don't believe me, but it was there, right in the lagoon. It was big and green and real slick. If you say so, Billy. He winked at Sheena. I wanted to punch his lights out. Big deal, science student. What did he know? Alexander was in his early 20s. But unlike Dr. D, he didn't look like a scientist. He looked more like, like a big old football player. Very tall, about, say, six foot four inches, and, you know, like, really muscular. He had broad shoulders and big, powerful-looking hands. He also had thick, wavy blonde hair and blue eyes that crinkled in the corners. He spent a lot of time in the sun, so he had a smooth, dark tan. I hope you're all hungry. I made chicken salad sandwiches for lunch. Oh, great. Alexander did most of the cooking. He thought he was good at it, too, but he wasn't. I went below the deck to my cabin to change out of my wet bathing suit. My cabin was really just this tiny little sleeping cubby. Sheena had one just like it. Dr. D and Alexander had bigger cabins that they could actually, like, walk around in. We ate in the galley, which was what Dr. D called the boat's kitchen. It had a built-in table and built-in seats and a small area for the cooking. When I entered the galley, Sheena was already sitting at the table. There was one big sandwich on a plate in front of her, and one waiting for me. Neither of us was too eager to try Alexander's chicken salad. The night before, we had Brussels sprouts and a casserole. For breakfast this morning, he served us whole wheat pancakes that sank to the bottom of my stomach like the Titanic going down. Um, you first. Uh-uh, you try it. You're older. There was nothing to do but taste it. I sank my teeth into the sandwich and started chewing. It wasn't too bad. A little chicken and a little mayonnaise. It actually tasted like a regular chicken salad sandwich. Then suddenly, my tongue started to burn, and my whole mouth was on fire. I grabbed for the iced tea in front of me and downed an entire glass. Fire coral! You put fire coral in the chicken salad! <laughs> Just a little chili pepper for taste. You like it? I think I'd rather have cereal for lunch, if you don't mind. You can't have cereal for every meal. No wonder you're so skinny, Sheena. You never eat anything but cereal. Uh, where's your spirit of adventure? I think I'll have cereal, too, just for a change of pace. Hey, what's for lunch? Chicken salad sandwiches. I made them spicy. Yeah, very spicy. Oh, really? You know, I'm not very hungry. I, I think I'll just have cereal for lunch. Maybe Billy and I could make dinner tonight. It's not fair for Alexander to cook all the time. Well, that's a nice idea, Sheena. What do you two know how to make? I know how to make brownies from a mix. And I know how to make fudge. Hmm. Maybe I'll cook tonight. Uh, how does grilled fish sound? Great! After lunch, Dr. D went into his office to go over some notes while Alexander showed Sheena and me around the main lab. 
It had three big glass tanks along the wall filled with weird, amazing fish. The smallest tank held two bright yellow seahorses and an underwater trumpet. The underwater trumpet was a long red and white fish shaped like a big tube. The biggest tank held a long black and yellow snake-like thing with a mouth full of teeth. Ew, that one is really gross. That's a black ribbon eel. He bites, but he's not deadly. We call him Biff. I turned away from the fish tanks and stood by the control panel, staring at all the knobs and dials. Most of the dials were all lit up, with little red indicators moving across their faces. I noticed one dial that was dark. It's red indicator still. What's this for? It looks like you forgot to turn it on. Oh, that controls the Nansen bottle. It's broken. What's a Nansen bottle? It collects samples of seawater from way down deep. Why don't you fix it? Uh, we can't afford to. Why not? Doesn't the university give you money? They gave us money for our research, but it's almost gone. We're waiting to see if they'll give us more. In the meantime, we don't have the money to fix things. What if the Cassandra breaks down or something? <laughs> then I guess we'll have to put her in dry dock for a while, or else find a new way to get more money. Bummer, that would mean no more summer visits. I hated to think of the Cassandra just sitting on a dock. Even worse was the thought of Dr. D being stuck on land with no fish to study. Our uncle was miserable whenever he had to go ashore. He didn't feel comfortable unless he was on a boat. I know because one Christmas he came to our house to visit. I mean, usually Dr. D is like really fun to be with. But that Christmas, Dr. D spent the whole time pacing through the house. He barked orders at us like some kind of mean old sea captain. Billy, sit up straight. Sheena, swab the decks. I mean, he just wasn't himself at all. Finally, on Christmas Eve, my dad couldn't take it anymore. He told Dr. D to shape up or ship out. So Dr. D ended up spending a good part of Christmas Day in the bathtub, playing with my old toy boats. I never wanted to see Dr. D stranded on land again. Don't worry, kids. Dr. D has always found a way to get by. Who wants to feed Biff today? Not me. Yuck. I thought I heard a motor outside, so I stepped to a porthole and peered out. So far, we had seen very few other boats. Not many people passed by Alondra. A white boat chugged up to the side of the Cassandra. It was smaller but newer than our boat. A logo on the side said Marina Zoo. A man and a woman stood on the deck of the zoo boat. They were both neatly dressed in khaki pants and button-down shirts, and the man had a short, neat haircut, and the woman's brown hair was pulled back in a ponytail. She carried a black briefcase. The man waved to someone on the deck of the Cassandra, so I figured he had to be waving at Dr. D or something. Who's that? I'd better go see what this is about. Could you feed Biff? I'll be back later. Alexander handed Sheena the net with the guppies in it and left the lab in a hurry. Sheena looked at the squirming guppies in the net, stuck the net in my hand, and ran out of the cabin. I didn't want to watch Biff eat the poor fish either, but I didn't know what else to do. I quickly dumped the guppies into Biff's tank. The eel's head shot forward. His teeth clamped down on a fish, and the guppy disappeared. Then Biff grabbed for another one. He was a fast eater. I dropped the net on a table and walked out of the lab. As I was passing Dr. D's office, I heard voices. So I figured Dr. D and Alexander must be in there with, you know, the two people from the zoo boat. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, I swear. But the man from the zoo had such a loud voice, and what he said was the most amazing thing I had ever heard in my whole entire life. I don't care how you do it, Dr. Deep, but I want you to find that mermaid. A mermaid? I couldn't believe it. Did he really want my uncle to find a real live mermaid? I knew Sheena would start chanting, no such thing, no such thing. But here was a grown man, a man who worked for a zoo, talking about a mermaid. It had to be real. I might be one of the first people on Earth ever to see a mermaid. And then I had an even better thought. What if I was the one to find her? I'd be famous. I mean, I'd be on TV, magazines, everything. William Deep Jr., the famous sea explorer. Well, after I heard that, I couldn't just walk away. I pressed my ear to the door and listened closely. Mr. Showalter, Ms. Wickman, now please understand, I'm a scientist, not a circus trainer. 
My work is serious. I, I can't waste my time looking for fairy tale creatures. We're quite serious, Dr. Deep. There is a mermaid in these waters, and we believe if anyone can find her, you can. Well, what makes you think there's really a mermaid out there? Look, a fisherman from a nearby island spotted her. He said he got pretty close to her, and he's sure she's real. He saw her near a reef, just off Alondra. Some of these fishermen are very superstitious, Mr. Showalter. For years there have been stories, but no real reason to believe them. We didn't believe the man ourselves. Well, not at first. But we asked some other fishermen in the area, and they claimed to have seen the mermaid, too. And I think they're telling the truth. All of their descriptions of her match, down to the smallest detail. And how exactly did they describe her? Well, they said she looked like a young girl, except for the fishtail. She's small, delicate, with long blonde hair. They described her tail as shiny and bright green. I know it sounds incredible, Dr. Deep, but when we spoke to the fishermen, we were convinced that they really saw a mermaid. And why exactly do you want to capture this mermaid? Obviously, a real, live mermaid would be a spectacular attraction at a zoo like ours. People from all over the world would flock to see her. The Marina Zoo would make millions of dollars. Look, we're prepared to pay you very well for your trouble, Dr. Deep. Now, I understand you're running out of money. What if the university refuses to give you more? Have you thought about that? It would be terrible if you had to stop your important work just because of that. The Marina Zoo can promise you one million dollars if you can find the mermaid. I'm sure your lab could run for a long time on that much money, Dr. Deep. That's quite a lot of money, Ms. Whitman. But even if mermaids existed, I wouldn't feel right about capturing one for a zoo to put on display. I promise you we will take excellent care of her. I give you my word on this. Our dolphins and whales at Marina Zoo are very well cared for. The mermaid, of course, would get extra special treatment. And remember, if you don't find her, someone else will. There's no guarantee that they will treat the mermaid as well as we intend to. I suppose you're right. It would certainly be a big boost for my research if I found her. Then you'll do it. Yes, if there really is a mermaid, I'll find her. <laughs> I lost my balance and fell against the door. Dr. D and Mr. Showalter, Miss Wickman, and Alexander all gaped at me with their mouths wide open. I guess they hadn't expected me to drop in. Um, uh, hi everyone. Nice day for a mermaid hunt, hmm? This was supposed to be a secret. Don't worry about Billy. You can trust him. I am so embarrassed. This is my nephew, Billy Deep. He and his sister are visiting me for a few weeks. Can they keep our secret? Yes, I'm sure they can. Billy won't say anything to anyone, right, Billy? No, I won't tell anyone, I swear. Just to be on the safe side, Billy, don't mention the mermaid to Sheena. She's too young to uh, have to keep a big secret like this. I promise I won't breathe a word to Sheena. This was so cool. I knew the biggest secret in the whole wide world, and Sheena wouldn't even have a clue. The man and a woman from the zoo exchanged glances. I could see they were still a bit worried. You really can trust Billy. He's very serious for someone his age. You bet I'm serious. I'm William Deep Jr., world-famous mermaid catcher. Mr. Showalter and Miss Wickman seemed to relax a little. Miss Wickman shook hands with Dr. D, Alexander, and me. Mr. Showalter gathered up some papers and put them into his briefcase. We'll see you in a few days, then. Good luck. I won't need any luck because I have skill and courage. My head spun with all kinds of exciting thoughts. Would I let Sheena be on TV with me after I single-handedly captured the mermaid? Probably not. That night, I sneaked off the boat and swam noiselessly toward the lagoon. Where was the mermaid? I listened really hard. The sound was really faint at first, but then it grew louder. It rumbled like an earthquake on the ocean floor. The waves tumbled and tossed, and I struggled to stay on top of them. Suddenly, from the middle of the lagoon, a huge wave started to swell. It rose as high as a building. The wave broke, and a dark creature pushed up underneath it. Water slid off its grotesque body. 
Its single eye stared at me, its tentacles stretched and curled all around me. I tried to turn and swim away, but it was way too fast. The tentacles whipped out and grabbed me, tightening around my waist. Then a spiny cold tentacle wrapped around my neck and started to squeeze. I... I can't breathe! Help me! Somebody! I opened my eyes, and I was lying in bed in my cabin. The sheet was wrapped tightly around me. It was only a dream. I rubbed my eyes and peered out the porthole. The sun was just rising over the horizon, and the dark water looked inviting. I slipped into my bathing suit and crept out as quietly as I could. In the galley, I saw a half-empty pot of coffee sitting on the warmer, which meant Dr. D was already up. So I tiptoed down the passageway and listened to Dr. D. He was puttering around in the main lab. I grabbed my snorkel, flippers, and mask and went up on deck. The coast was clear. I climbed down the ladder and slipped into the water. Then I snorkeled toward the lagoon. It was crazy to sneak away like that, but you can imagine how excited I was. I mean, even in my wildest daydreams as William Deep Jr. undersea explorer, I never thought I would see a real live mermaid. Half human, half fish. Does she think like a human or like a fish? Can she talk? I mean, I really hope so. I mean, then she could tell me all the secrets of the ocean. I mean, how she breathes underwater and all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, this is going to be the greatest adventure of my life. After I'm famous, I'll write a big book, and I'll call it Courage of the Deep. Maybe someone will even turn it into a big movie. I raised my head and saw that I was nearing the reef. I kicked my legs carefully, watching out for the red coral. I was nearly past the reef when I felt something brush my leg. Then I felt something wrap around my ankle. This time, I knew for sure it was not seaweed. Seaweed doesn't have claws. Ignoring the panic that throws me, I kicked and thrashed with all my strength. Sheena's head appeared beside me. She pulled up her snorkeling mask. Oh, come on. I didn't scratch you that hard. You don't have to go crazy. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? You know Dr. D told us not to swim here. Then you shouldn't be here, should you? I knew you were up to something, so I followed you. I'm not up to anything. I'm just snorkeling. Sure, Billy. You're just snorkeling at 6.30 in the morning exactly where you're not supposed to and where you burned your foot on that fire coral yesterday. You're either up to something or you're totally crazy. She squinted at me, waiting for a response. What a choice. I was either up to something or crazy. Well, which should I admit to? If I admitted I was up to something, I'd have to tell her all about the mermaid. And I could not do that. Okay, I guess I'm crazy. Well, big news. Will you come back to the boat? Dr. D will be looking for us. You go back. I'll be there in a little while. Billy, Dr. D is going to be very mad. He's probably ready to hop in the dinghy and search for us right now. I was about to give up and go with her. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a big splash on the other side of the reef. The mermaid! I mean, it's gotta be her! If I don't go look for her now, I might miss her. So, I turned away from Sheena and started swimming very, very fast, straight for the reef. Billy, come back! Billy! I heard an extra note of panic in her voice, but I ignored it. No way was I gonna stop now. But as it turned out, I should have. I made my way past the reef into the deep still waters of the lagoon. That's when I saw it, a few hundred yards away. Not the green fishtail of a mermaid, but the gray, white triangle fin of a hammerhead shark. As I stared in horror, the fin turned toward me, moving straight like a torpedo. I plunged toward the reef. Suddenly, the fin shot up in front of me, between me and the reef. The shark was closing in, making the circle smaller and smaller as he swam faster and faster. I was trapped, but I couldn't just float there waiting for the shark to come and eat me. I had to fight, but I was too terrified to think clearly. The same two words echoed in my brain. The shark! The shark! It swam around me in a tight circle. Its tail swished, sending up waves of water all over me. I could see him clearly. He was at least, at least ten feet long. His head was like the head of a hammer, with an eye on each end. The shark! The shark! The shark bumped me with its snout. It wanted to fight. It circled me again, then zoomed straight forward towards me. 
his jaws open. I saw rows and rows of big, sharp teeth. I thrashed and kicked with all my strength. The razor teeth rushed by. Just missing my leg, I grabbed the red fire coral. Pain shot through my hand. I didn't care. I tried to pull myself up to the top of the reef. Just above the surface, I almost made it, too. I mean, soon I'd be safe, right? With a mighty kick, I hoisted myself onto the reef and was hit back into the water. My stomach slammed against the side of the reef. I felt a sharp stab of pain in my leg. I tried to pull my leg away, but I just couldn't. I was caught in the jaws of the shark. The shark knew he had me, too. I had no strength left to fight. Suddenly, something splashed nearby. The shark released my leg and jerked toward the splash. A long, shiny green fishtail rose out of the water and smacked the shark hard. It went under. All around me, the water bubbled and churned with white foam. I heard shrill animal squeals. I mean, sharks don't squeal, do they? It surfaced again, its toothy jaws gaping. But the long green fishtail rose out of the water and delivered a direct hit on his broad hammerhead. The shark shut its jaws and sank below the surface. A second later, the huge gray fin surfaced a few yards away, swimming off in the other direction. Then I heard a low musical sound. It sounded something like a whale, but this creature was much smaller than a whale. The green tail swung around and the creature lifted a head with long, blonde hair. The mermaid! I mean, she looked just like the zoo people had said she would. Her head and shoulders were smaller than mine. But her flashing green tail stretched out long and powerful. Her wide sea green eyes sparkled. Her skin gave off a pale pink glow. She was so real and so beautiful. You, you saved my life. You saved my life. Thank you. What can I do in return? I'll do anything. She was trying to talk to me, too. I wish I could understand her. She reached for my hand and examined it frowning over the red burn from the fire coral. Her hand felt really cool. She passed it over the palm of my hand, and the pain from the burns began to fade away. When she held my hand, I could float without treading water, just as she did. Was this another dream? The shark had vanished. The water had calmed, shimmering like gold now under the morning sunlight. And there I was, floating in the sea off a deserted island with a real mermaid. Sheena would never believe this. Not in a million years. Some of the mermaid flipped her tail and disappeared under the water. Startled, I searched around for her. She had left without a trace, not a ripple, not even a bubble. Is she gone? Just like that? I mean, would I ever see her again? Turn the tape over. Unless you've got goosebumps. <laughs> my eyes and looked for her again, but no sign of her. A few fish darted past me. She had disappeared so instantly, I began to think that I had dreamed her up after all. Just then, I felt a tiny pinch on my foot. Was the shark back? I turned around, and the mermaid was smiling at me. She snapped her fingers in a pinching motion. <laughs> it was you! You're worse than my little sister! Suddenly, a dark shadow fell across her face. I looked up to see a heavy net drop over us. Startled, I thrashed my arms and legs, but that only tangled them more in the rope. The net tightened over both of us. We were thrown together as the net jerked us up. The mermaid's eyes widened. I gazed up through the holes in the net and recognized Dr. D and Sheena. They struggled to pull us aboard the dinghy and we landed in a heap on the floor. Sheena stared down at me and the mermaid in amazement. Dr. D's eyes were wide and his mouth hung open. The mermaid was squirming beside me and Dr. D watched her closely. He touched her tail. The mermaid flapped it hard against the bottom of the boat. Billy, I don't believe it. You found her. You've actually found the mermaid. Just get me out of this net, will ya? The zoo people were right. It's unbelievable. It's astounding. It's historic. Is there any way this could be a hoax? Billy, is this one of your dumb tricks? It's not a trick. Now, will you just get me out of this net? The ropes are digging into my skin. 
I can't believe it. She's really real. Of course she's real. We're both real, and we're both very uncomfortable. Well, it's hard to believe anything you say. After all, you've been talking about sea monsters ever since we got here. I did see a sea monster. Quiet, kids. Let's get our discovery back to the sea land. He started the dinghy's motor, and we roared back to the big boat. Alexander stood on deck waiting for us. Sheena tied the dinghy to the side of the Cassandra, while Dr. D and Alexander hoisted me and the mermaid aboard. Dr. D opened the net and helped me out. The mermaid flopped her tail and got herself even more tangled in the net. It's really true. It's really a mermaid. I'm proud of you, Billy. How did you do it? This is amazing. Do you realize this is the greatest ocean find of the century? Maybe of all time. Well, thanks, but I didn't do anything. I didn't find her. She found me. We've got to do something for her. Dr. D, you've got to let her go. She needs to be in the water. I'll fill the big tank with seawater, Dr. D. We can't let her go just yet, Billy. Not without examining her first. Oh, we won't hurt her. She'll be all right. Oh, you're bleeding, Billy. Are you okay? I'm fine, but the mermaid isn't. How did this happen? A shark grabbed my leg. Just as he was about to clamp down, the mermaid came. She saved my life. You should have seen her, Dr. D. Fighting that shark, she was amazing. Wow, she fought off a shark all by herself? Look, let's just forget about my leg for now, okay? You've got to let the mermaid go. Billy, I'm a scientist. This mermaid is an extremely important discovery. If I let her go, I'd be letting down the entire scientific community. I'd be letting down the entire world. Oh, so I guess you don't want the million dollars, then. That's not fair, Billy. I think you know me better than that. I only want the money to continue my research. I would never use this mermaid to get rich. Just think about it, Billy. You found a mermaid. A creature we all thought didn't exist. We can't just let her go. We've got to find out a little bit about her. We won't hurt her, Billy, I promise. The tank is ready, Dr. D. Thank you, Alexander. Dr. D followed Alexander to the other side of the boat. I glanced at Sheena to see whose side she was on. Did she want to keep the mermaid or let her go? But Sheena just stood there watching. I could tell she wasn't sure which was right. But when I looked at the mermaid, I knew I was right. She had finally stopped squirming and flipping her tail. And now she was laying still on the deck, and the net was still draped over her. She was breathing hard and staring out at the ocean with watery, sad eyes. I wished I had never tried to find her in the first place. Now, all I wanted was to find some way to get her back to her home. Dr. D and Alexander came back, with Alexander holding her tail and Dr. D her head. They carried her to the giant glass tank. It stood on the deck now, full of fresh seawater. They gently dropped her into the tank, pulling the net away as she slid into the water. Then they put a screen top over the tank and clamped it shut. The mermaid churned the water with her tail. Then, gradually, her tail stopped moving. She grew still and her body slumped lifelessly to the bottom of the tank. She didn't move or breathe. She's dead! We killed her! The mermaid isn't dead. She's crying or something. Now what do we do? Well, we've got to find a method of feeding her. Does she eat like a person or a fish? If only she could tell us. She can't talk, can she, Billy? I don't think so. She just makes sounds, like whistles and clicks and hums and stuff. I'll go down to the lab and get some equipment ready. Maybe we can find out something about her with the sonar monitor. Good idea. Well, I think I'd better go to Santa Anita for some supplies and lots of different kinds of food. We can try them out on her until we find something she likes. Would you two like anything while I'm there? Yeah, how about some peanut butter? There's no way Alexander can ruin a peanut butter sandwich. Peanut butter it is. Anything else? Billy? All right, I'll be back in a few hours. It's so hot. I'm going down to my cabin for a while. Okay. It was hot up on deck, and there was no breeze, and the white hot noon sun was beating down on my face. But I couldn't go below deck. I couldn't leave the mermaid. 
She floated behind the glass, her long tail drooping. I waved to her. I knew I was about to do something that would make Dr. D very angry. In fact, he would probably never forgive me, but I didn't care. I was going to do what I thought was right. I was going to set the mermaid free. My hand trembled as I reached up to unlatch the screen at the top of the tank. As I struggled to pull the screen off, the mermaid began to squeal. Shh! Don't make any noise. Billy, what are you doing? Oh, I was gonna let her go, Alexander. You can't keep her in there. Look how unhappy she is. Billy, you've got to understand how important this mermaid is to your uncle. He's worked his whole life for a discovery like this. It would break his heart if you let her go. But what about her heart? I think it's breaking her heart just to be stuck in that fish tank. It's not ideal, I know that. But it's only temporary. Soon she'll have plenty of room to swim and play in. As an exhibit at the zoo with millions of people gawking at her every day, I turned back to look at the mermaid again. But Alexander put his arm around my shoulders and slowly led me away from the tank. Hey, want some lunch? I'll whip up something special. We can have a picnic up on the deck with the mermaid. Come on. Well, I was hungry, but not for spicy chicken salad. What could I do? I followed him to the kitchen. He opened the small refrigerator and pulled out a bowl. It was full of thin strips of something white and rubbery looking. They floated in an oily, dark gray liquid. Whatever it was, I knew I couldn't eat it. It's marinated squid. I added some squid ink for extra flavor. That's what makes it gray. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had squid ink for days. Don't be sarcastic. You might be surprised. Take this up on deck. I'll bring some bread and iced tea. I carried the bowl of squid up to the deck, and I set it down near the mermaid's tank. She flipped her tail a little, and then she opened and closed her mouth as if she were chewing. How are you doing, mermaid? Are you hungry? If she stays with us long enough, you might be able to talk to her in sign language. <laughs> Just think of the things we could learn. Likes to eat squid. Hey, wait! That's our lunch! <laughs> At least somebody around here likes my cooking. About an hour later, Dr. D returned with the groceries and supplies. Luckily, he had bought plenty of seafood in Santa Anita. We fed some of it to the mermaid for supper, and while she ate, Dr. D checked the readings of the meters that Alexander had set up in the tank. Interesting. She sends out sonar signals through the water, just as whales do. What does that mean? It means there are probably other mermaids like her. She must be trying to contact them with underwater sounds. Poor mermaid. She's calling to her friends to rescue her. I went to my cabin after supper and stared out of the little porthole. An orange sun sank slowly into the purple horizon, and then the sky immediately darkened. The mermaid is up there all alone, I thought. She must be so frightened. Suddenly, the door to my cabin burst open. Sheena flew in, panting, her eyes wide. Sheena! How many times do I have to tell you to knock first? But Billy, the mermaid escaped. She's not in her tank. I leaped off my bed and scrambled up the hatch and out on deck. There was the mermaid floating silently in the water, her green tail shimmering faintly in the fading light. Hey! <laughs> gotcha again, Billy. <laughs> Good one, Sheena. Very clever. Oh, you're just mad because I fooled you again. You're so easy to trick. The mermaid raised her eyes to me, and a faint smile formed on her pale lips. She's hoping I'll let her go now. I mean, maybe I should. Sheena could actually help me. I mean, it would be easier with the two of us. But would my sister cooperate? She really is pretty. Sheena. Hey, kids, it's almost bedtime. Ready to go below? Oh, we never go to bed this early at home. Maybe not, but I bet you don't get up so early at home either, do you? Sheena shook her head. We all stood at the tank and watched the mermaid in silence. She pressed her tiny hands against the glass wall of the tank and with her eyes pleaded with us to set her free. Then she gave her tail a little flick and settled back down into the bottom of the tank. Hey, don't worry about her. I'll check on her during the night to make sure she's all right. She'll feel better once she gets to Marina Zoo. You know, they're building a special lagoon just for her, with a reef and everything. It'll be exactly like the lagoon off Elandra. 
She'll be free to swim and play. She'll feel at home. I hope so, but I didn't feel so sure. The Cassandra rocked gently on the waves that night, but I couldn't fall asleep. I know Dr. D cared about the mermaid, but what would happen to her when the zoo people took her away? I mean, sure, they're building a fancy fake lagoon, but it won't be the same as the real lagoon, and there probably will be people all around staring at her all the time. They'll probably expect her to perform tricks like a trained seal and, and put her in TV shows and movies, and she'll be a lonely prisoner for the rest of her life, and it'll all be my fault. How could I let this happen? I have to do something. I can't let them take her. Just then, I thought I heard a noise. I laid very still and I listened. At first, I thought it was the mermaid, but I quickly realized it was a motor. I heard it chugging softly from a distance, but slowly the sound moved closer. It was a boat. I sat up and I peered out the porthole. A large boat pulled quietly up beside the Cassandra. Was it the zoo people? In the middle of the night? No, this boat was way bigger. As I peered out the small porthole, I saw two dark figures quietly slip on board the Cassandra, then two more. My heart began to race. Who are these people, I thought, and what are they doing? Should I sneak up and spy on them? What if they see me? Then I heard more strange noises. They were coming from the deck where the mermaid was trapped helplessly in her tank. Oh no, they're hurting the mermaid. I charged up to the deck and over to the fish tank. She was right behind me. The mermaid was huddled at the bottom of the tank, her arms wrapped protectively around herself. Four men were standing tensely near the tank, all dressed in black with masks pulled over their faces. One of the men held a small club in his hand, and a body laid sprawled on the deck face down. Dr. D! Sheena ran to her uncle and knelt beside him. They hit him on the head and knocked him out. Who are you? What are you doing on our boat? The four men ignored me. Two of them unfolded a heavy rope net and spread it over the fish tank. They let it fall into the tank, draping it over the mermaid. Stop it! What are you doing? Be quiet, kid. It was the man with the club. He raised it menacingly. I watched helplessly as they tightened the net around the mermaid. They were kidnapping her. She started to thrash her arms, struggling to free herself from the heavy net. Sheena was bent over Dr. D, frantically trying to wake him up. I ran to the hatch. Alexander! Alexander, help! Alexander was big and strong, maybe even strong enough to stop these guys. I ran back to the tank. The mermaid was trapped in the net. All four men worked to lift her. She squirmed and fought with all her strength. Can't you get her to shut up? Just load her on board. Stop! You can't do that! Let her go! Forget about the mermaid. You'll never see her again. I grabbed the rail. My heart was pounding in my chest. I couldn't stand the mermaid's terrified screams. I couldn't let them take her, not without a fight. She had saved my life once, and now it was my turn to save hers. But what could I do? They had lifted the mermaid out of the tank. Three men held her in the net. She squirmed and thrashed like crazy, splashing water all over the deck. I'll tackle them and I'll knock them over. Then I'll push the mermaid into the ocean and she can swim away to safety. Lowering my head like a football player, I took a deep breath and ran straight at them. Billy, stop! I crashed into one of the men holding the net, butting him hard in the stomach with my head. To my dismay, the man hardly moved. He grabbed me with his free hand, lifted me up off the deck, and heaved me into the fish tank. Then I watched the men through the glass toss the mermaid aboard their boat. They were getting away! I tried to scramble out of the tank, but it was too tall. I kept slipping down the wet glass, unable to reach the top. I knew there was only one person who could stop these masked men now. Alexander. But where was he? Hadn't he heard all the noise? Alexander! Alexander, please! Stop them! Finally, he appeared on deck. I saw his big blonde head and muscular body moving toward me at last. I could hear the motor of the other boat began to rumble. One by one, the masked men lowered themselves off our boat. Three of them had left the Cassandra. Only one remained on deck. Through the glass, I watched Alexander run over to him and grab his shoulder. Yes, get him, Alexander, get him! i never seen Alexander hit anyone before, but I knew he could do it if he had to. But Alexander didn't hit the masked man. Instead, he asked him a question. 
Is the mermaid safely on board? Good. And have you got the money for me? Got it! All right. Let's get out of here. I nearly choked on a mouthful of water. I just couldn't believe that Alexander was working with the masked men. He had seemed like such a good guy. But I knew now that he arranged the whole thing. He had to be the one who had told them the mermaid was on board our boat. Alexander, how could you? Hey, Billy, it's just business. The zoo was going to pay a million dollars for the mermaid, but my new bosses will pay 20 million. You know arithmetic, Billy. Which would you choose? You rat! Then, I saw Sheena stand up. Lowering my gaze to the deck, I saw that Dr. D was moving. Alexander didn't seem to notice. He stepped over Dr. D's body. He didn't even care that Dr. D could have been hurt badly. I watched my uncle reach up and grab Alexander by the ankle. Alexander tripped and fell hard onto his elbows and knees. Two of the men climbed back aboard the Cassandra and grabbed Dr. D. Sheena ran at them, flailing them with her puny little fists. Of course they didn't do any good. The third masked man grabbed her arms and pinned them behind her back. She tried to kick the man who held her, but he just tightened his grip. She couldn't even move. Let him go! Hey, what should we do with him? Whatever you do, do it quickly. We've got to get out of here. They might call the police or the Coast Guard. We'd better kill him. Alexander! I know you're not a cruel man. Don't let them do this. He lowered himself onto the other boat. What a creep! Two of the masked men lifted Dr. D up high and dropped him into the tank. He landed beside me. Sheena was next. They tossed her in easily. The men replaced the screen lid, then clamped it shut. I stared out at them, realizing in horror that we had no way to escape. The water in the tank was about six feet deep. We all kicked and paddled, trying to stay above the surface. There was barely enough room for the three of us in there. All right, let's go. Wait, you can't just leave us here. Oh, yeah, you're right. We can't. So they aren't heartless monsters after all. They weren't going to leave us. But what were they going to do? The first man signaled the other three. They stepped toward us and raised their hands to one side of the tank. One, two, three. On three, they pushed the tank over to the side of the deck, and we were thrown together. Then our bodies slammed against the side of the tank as it dropped into the ocean. Water began to seep through. We watched the kidnapper's boat as it roared away. Our tank rocked in its wake. Then it started to sink. We're going under. We're going to drown. All three of us desperately pushed against the screen. I beat my fists against it. Dr. D tried to get his shoulder against it, but the tank tilted in the water and we were all tossed back. The screen was made of heavy steel mesh and clamped onto the top of the tank. We couldn't reach the clamps from inside, so we had to try to break through. We pushed with all our strength. It wouldn't budge. The tank slowly sank deeper below the surface of the dark rolling water. The moon disappeared behind a blanket of clouds, leaving us in total darkness. We had only a minute or two before the tank dropped completely below the surface. I'm so afraid. Dr. D pounded his fists against the glass tank wall, trying to break through. I ran my hands all along the top of the tank, looking for a weak spot in the screen. Then I hit something, a tiny latch. I fumbled with it, trying to open it. It's stuck. Let me try. <laughs> it's jammed shut. Maybe we can loosen it with this. Sheena took a red barrette from her hair, and Dr. D took it and scraped hard around the latch. It's working. Maybe there's hope. Dr. D stopped scraping and tugged at the latch. It moved. We all pushed at the screen, but it didn't open. We pushed again. The latch hadn't opened it after all. Two other latches held the screen in place. Two latches we couldn't reach. We all grew silent. The water had risen nearly to the top of the tank. Soon it would come rushing in on us. Suddenly, the ocean darkened. The waters grew choppy and the tank rocked a little faster. What's that noise? Through the churning of the water, I heard a strange sound. It was very faint, as if it was coming from really far away. It sounds like a siren. Lots of sirens. I've, I've never heard anything like it. What can it be? It's coming from all around us. Suddenly, dark, shadowy forms swirled around the tank. I peered through the foam, straining to see. Out of the murky water, a face appeared. Mermaids! Dozens of them. What do they want? They look angry. Revenge. 
They've come for revenge. We took their friend, and now they're going to pay us back. Then, suddenly, the tank began to rise up out of the water. Huh? What's happening? Well, they, they're pushing us back up. The mermaids aren't taking revenge. They're saving us. The tank brushed up against the Cassandra. I could see the mermaid's tiny hands working above us. The clamps popped open. The screen was pulled off, and Dr. D boosted Sheena up. She scrambled on board the boat, and then I climbed aboard. And we both helped pull Dr. D out of the tank. We were drenched, shivering from the cold. But we were safe. The mermaids swarmed around the boat, their pale eyes peering up at us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saving our lives. This was the second time a mermaid had saved my life. I owed them more than ever now. We've got to get that kidnapped mermaid back. Who knows what Alexander and those creeps will do to her. Yeah, look what they tried to do to us. I wish we could rescue her, but I don't see how we can. How will we find the kidnapper's boat in the dark? They're long gone by now. I knew there had to be a way. I leaned over the rail, peering down at the mermaids floating beside us. Hey! We need your help! We want to find your friend! Please, can you take us to her? The mermaids chattered and whistled to one another. The three of us stared in amazement as the mermaids began to form a long line. One mermaid after the other, stretching far out to sea. Do you think they're going to lead us to the kidnappers? Maybe. But how will the mermaids find the boat? Oh, I know. I'll bet they'll use their sonar. I wish I had time to really listen to those sounds they're making. Look, Dr. D! The mermaids are swimming away. Quick! We've got to follow them. No, it's too dangerous. We can't find Alexander and four big masked men by ourselves. We should call the island police. Yeah, but what would we say? That we're chasing after a kidnapped mermaid? No one would believe us. Dr. D, we have to follow them. Please? The mermaids are swimming out of sight. Okay, let's get going. I hurried to the stern to untie the dinghy, and Dr. D dropped it into the water and jumped in. Sheena and I followed him. Dr. D started the motor, and we raced after the shimmering line of mermaids. They glided so quickly through the rolling waters, it was hard for the small boat to keep up with them. About 15 or 20 minutes later, we found ourselves in a small deserted cove. The moon cast pale light on a dark boat anchored near the shore. Dr. D cut the motor so the kidnappers wouldn't hear us approaching. They must be asleep. How can Alexander sleep after what he did to us? He left us to drown. Money can make people do terrible things. But it's good they think we're dead. They won't be expecting us. But where's the mermaid? What happened to all the mermaids? Suddenly, at the side of the kidnapper's boat, I saw ripples in the water. Then I saw a flash of blonde hair in the moonlight. The mermaid was floating in the water, tied to the back of the kidnapper's boat. They must not have a tank to keep her in. Lucky for us. Suddenly, we saw other figures rippling in the water. Mermaids arched up, circling the captured mermaid. I saw tail fins raised like giant fans. I saw hands reach around the mermaid, hands tugging at the rope that held her. The waters tossed quietly as the figures worked. Look! The mermaids are setting her free! What are we going to do? We'll just make sure she gets away safely. Then we'll slip away. The kidnappers will never know we were here. Come on, mermaids! Hurry! Maybe they need some help. Dr. D began to steer toward the mermaids. Suddenly, a light flared on the kidnappers' boat. A match set flame to a torch. What do you think you're doing? I ducked away as the flaming torch was thrust in my face. Behind the torch, I could see the kidnapper glaring straight down at me. He had quickly pulled on his black mask. It covered only the top of his face. I heard a clamoring sound, cries of surprise. Alexander and the other three kidnappers appeared on the deck. Hey, how did you get here? Why aren't you dead? We've come for the mermaid. You can't keep her here. Find us, keep us. You've made a long trip for nothing. And now look. Your boat's on fire! He lowered the torch to the dinghy and set it aflame. Don't leave the boat! You'll drown! Billy, get a life jacket! Sheena, find the bucket! Throw water on the flames! Hurry! The fire crackled. The bright flames shot higher. 
Dr. D grabbed a yellow life jacket from the bottom of the dinghy and started frantically beating out the fire. I found a life jacket and beat at the flames. Sheena dumped seawater onto them as fast as she could. Over the crackling flames, Alexander shouted. Get the mermaid aboard! Let's get out of here! Dr. D, they're getting away! The mermaid! Where's the mermaid? I turned to the side of the boat. The mermaid was gone! Her friends had freed her! And one of the kidnappers reached down from his boat and grabbed me. I tried to squirm away, but he held me tight. Sheena tugged at his hands, trying to help me escape. The third kidnapper picked her up by the wrists and threw her to the floor of the dinghy. Then I saw another kidnapper swing a club at Dr. D's head. Dr. D dodged the club. The kidnapper tried to hit him in the stomach. Then Dr. D dodged again. Alexander didn't move from his spot on the deck. He stood with his brawny arms crossed in front of him, calmly watching the fight. The flames had nearly been quenched, but then suddenly flared up again. Sheena grabbed the bucket and poured seawater everywhere. One of the kidnappers kicked the bucket from her hand. It landed in the water with a splash. Sheena picked up a life jacket and beat the flames out. Drop down into their boat and toss them in the water. A man started to lower himself to our dinghy, but then suddenly he lurched forward, his arms flailing. It looked as if the boat had been slammed by a huge wave. It rocked slowly at first, then violently. I watched the kidnappers cling to the rail, screaming in confusion and surprise. Dr. D slowly stood up, trying to see what was happening. I could see the mermaids now. They had surrounded the kidnapper's ship and were rocking it hard. The kidnappers hung on helplessly. Mission accomplished. Dr. D started up the motor and roared off. Turning back, I could see the boat tilting and rocking all over in the water. And then I could see our mermaid swimming free. She was behind the other mermaids in the shimmering waves. She got away! She's free! I hope she'll be all right. We'll look for her tomorrow. We know where to find her now. I glanced at Sheena and she glanced back. Oh no. After all this, it can't be true. Is Dr. D gonna catch the mermaid again and give her to the zoo? The next morning, Sheena and I met in the galley. We were fixing our own breakfast since Alexander was gone. Sheena spooned some cereal into her mouth and chewed with a thoughtful look on her face. Do you think the mermaid went back to the lagoon? Probably. That's where she lives. Sheena, if someone gave you a million dollars, would you show them where the mermaid lives? No. Not if they wanted to capture her. Me neither. That's what I don't get. Dr. D is such a great guy. Why would he do it? I heard the sound of a motor. Sheena heard it too. We dropped our spoons and ran up on deck. Dr. D was standing there, staring out to sea. A white boat with Marina Zoo stenciled on the side was approaching. Sheena and I ducked behind the cockpit. We watched the Marina Zoo boat tie up beside the Cassandra. I recognized Mr. Showalter and Miss Wickman. Mr. Showalter tossed a rope to Dr. D, and Miss Wickman jumped aboard. The zoo people smiled and shook Dr. D's hand. Well, we're very excited. We had word from the fishermen on Santa Anita that you found the mermaid. We're ready to take her with us now. Here's a check for one million dollars, Dr. D. We've made it out to you and the Cassandra Research Lab. Thank you very much. A million dollars means a great deal to me and my work. Well, your zoo has been very generous. That's why I'm sorry to have to do this. Dr. D reached out a hand and took the check from her. Then, he raised the envelope and tore it in half. Just what are you doing, Dr. D? I can't take the money. You sent me on a wild goose chase. I have searched every inch of that lagoon and all the surrounding waters, and I am now more convinced than ever before that mermaids do not exist. But what about the fishermen's stories? The local fishermen have told mermaid stories for years. I think they believe they've really seen mermaids rising through the mist on foggy days. But what they have seen are only fish or dolphins or, or manatees or even swimmers. Because mermaids don't exist. They're fantasy creatures. Are you sure about this? Completely sure. My equipment is very sensitive. It can pick up the tiniest minnow. We respect your opinion, Dr. D. I mean, hey, you're the leading expert on exotic sea creatures. That's why we came to you in the first place. Thank you. Then I hope you'll take my advice and drop your hunt for a mermaid. I guess we'll have to. Thank you for trying, Dr. Deep. 
They all shook hands. Then the zoo people got back on their boat and motored away. The coast was clear. Sheena and I came bursting out of our hiding place. Dr. D, you're the greatest. Thanks, guys. From now on, none of us will say anything to anyone about mermaids. Is that a deal? It's a deal. It's a deal. We all shook hands. I swore I'd never mention the mermaid to anyone. But I wanted to see her again for one last time just to say goodbye. After lunch, Sheena and Dr. D went to their cabins to take a nap. I pretended to take a nap too, but once they were asleep, I sneaked out of my cabin and swam over to the lagoon. The sun was high in the pale blue sky. It glowed down on the still lagoon waters, making them glitter as if it was covered in gold. Mermaid, where are you? I was just past the reef when I felt a playful tug on my leg. Had Sheena followed me again? I spun around to catch her, but no one was there. It was seaweed, probably. So I kept swimming. And a few seconds later, I felt the tug again, only harder this time. Hey, it must be the mermaid. I turned once again to search for her. The water rippled. Mermaid, is that you? Suddenly, a gigantic, slimy, dark green head popped out of the water. A head with one enormous eye and a mouthful of jagged teeth. It's the sea monster. The sea monster. Would they believe me this time? <laughs> Deep Trouble by R.L. Stein.